Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 28 of Advanced Linear Algebra. Today we're going to go through a couple examples of how to actually compute a complex spectral decomposition now that we know, thanks to lecture 27, that it always exists as long as the matrix that you're working with is normal. Okay, so we're going to be a little bit careful here because if you trace through our proof of the complex spectral decomposition, where it came from was sure triangularization. And then if you trace through the proof of Schur triangularization, where it came from, was this sort of iterative procedure where we compute an eigenvalue and an eigenvector of an n by n matrix, and then that less reduced to an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix, and then you would have to compute an eigenvalue and eigenvector of that matrix, which would reduce the dimension one more, and so on. To actually compute a Schur triangularization and therefore a complex spectral decomposition, you would have to solve n different eigenvalue eigenvector problems. And that's not something we want to do. That's major, major overkill. Instead, the way to think about the complex spectral decomposition is to notice that's a special case of diagonalization, okay? We've seen things like this way back in the previous linear algebra course. Sort of the highlight of introductory linear algebra was we were able to write a matrix as A equals PDP inverse, you know, most of the time, most matrices you can do that. So the only difference is that instead of having a P over here and a P inverse over here is now we've got a unitary matrix and it's inverse, right? So the only difference is that invertible matrix P is now a unitary matrix U. Okay, so the way that we're actually going to compute the complex spectral decomposition in practice is we're just going to do all of the same things that we did to compute diagonalizations in the previous course, except we're just going to take the minor extra care needed to ensure that the invertible matrix P is actually unitary. Okay, so let's go through a couple examples. Let's see how this works. Okay, so let's start off with sort of a two by two example. Okay, let's go through, let's find the spectral decomposition of this matrix A equals 1, 1, minus 1, 1. Okay, so to start off, you do the same thing that you do for diagonalization itself. You find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, right? Those are the bread and butter of diagonalization. Okay, so I'm going to jump through this calculation here because eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we already know how to calculate those. So for this matrix, the eigenvalues, well, there are two of them. There's one plus i and one minus i, and then there are corresponding eigenspaces corresponding to every eigenvalue, right? Okay, and so for the eigenvalue one plus i, it turns out that the eigenspace, well, it's just all of the non-zero multiples of the vector one i, and for the eigenvalue one minus i, the eigenvectors are just all of the non-zero multiples of one minus i. Okay, so I'm skipping over those calculations. Try those on your own. Those are linear algebra one calculations, okay? Next up, this is where things start to differ though, right? If you're just doing diagonalization itself, that would be basically all you need. Now you would stick things down the diagonal matrix D and then you would stick the corresponding eigenvectors, you know, as columns in the invertible matrix P. Okay, now we're gonna have to tweak things a little bit. Now we're gonna have to be careful though because we want a unitary matrix, not just an invertible one. Okay, so what we've got to do, the minor extra care that we've got to do, take care of, is we can't just construct a basis of each eigenspace, right? That's what we would do for regular diagonalization. To get a unitary matrix, we have to construct instead an orthonormal basis of each eigenspace. Okay, unfortunately, that's not too hard to do in this particular case, right? Each eigenspace is just one dimensional, right? Each eigenspace is just a line. So an orthonormal basis of a line, is just a unit vector on that line. It's, it's a vector with length one. So all we have to do is we have to choose the scalar C up here appropriately so that these vectors end up having length one, okay? So, I mean, for this first eigenvalue, pick one of these guys that has length one, well, I'll just throw a one over root two in front of it. You could have also picked a minus one over root two or even like an i over root two if you like, okay? Whatever, whatever scalar you want to throw in front so that the vector has length one. For the other eigenspace, you just do the same thing. So for the eigenvalue one minus i, well, I'm just gonna pick the same scalar, one over root two. You don't have to pick the same scalar for this other eigenspace, but it happens to work in this particular case, okay? So that's a unit vector, that's a unit vector. And because of the magic of the spectral theorem, these vectors, become because they're coming from different eigenspaces, they will be orthogonal to each other, okay? And you can check that if you like here, okay? But that's what's going to make it all work. All right, next up, once you get over that step three here, that's really the only new piece, this, this step three. Once you're done that, now you do your regular diagonalization thing. You stick eigenvalues down the diagonal of the matrix D, and you stick eigenvectors 
in as columns in a matrix that in the previous course we called P, now we're calling it U because it's a unitary matrix. All right, so place the eigenvalues along the diagonal of the diagonal matrix D and place the corresponding orthonormal bases of the corresponding eigenspaces as the columns of U in the same order. Okay, so let's see what these are. So D, again, just copying down, hey, these were my eigenvalues. I'm gonna place them along the diagonal in whatever order I like. The order does not matter here. Here I happened to pick this particular order, but it doesn't matter. All right, and now when you construct U, what you do is you take these unit eigenvectors that you constructed and you place them in as columns, being careful to put them in the same order that you place the eigenvalues in D, okay? So I pl place the eigenvalue one plus I first, so I'm gonna take the eigenvectors from one plus I first, okay? And that'll be my first column, right? So my first column is one over root two, one I. One over root two, one I is my first column. Okay, and then next I go to the eigenvalue one minus i, what's my eigenvector? Oh, well, it's one over root two, one minus i. So that's my second column. And that's it, okay? That is my spectral decomposition. This is a spectral decomposition of A, okay? And if you like, you can double check, okay? You can double check that if you compute u, d, u star using this u and this d, then yeah, you get exactly the matrix A that we started with. And also, I mean, it's also not obvious that this matrix actually is unitary, but you can double check that as well if you like, okay? And the way you do that is you compute u star u. And if that equals i, which it does, eh, it's unitary. Okay, so that's it. That's our spectral decomposition of that matrix. Okay, so let's ramp up a little bit and let's now look at how we compute a spectral decomposition for a three by three matrix. And all of the basic ideas are the same, but of course some of the details are gonna get a little bit nastier. So, spectral decomposition is a diagonalization. So we start off by computing eigenvalues and eigenvectors, just like back in the two by two example, okay? And again, I'm gonna skip over this because this is a linear algebra one calculation. You find your eigenvalues of that matrix. It turns out this time, one of the eigenvalues is gonna be repeated. It has algebraic multiplicity two, okay? So you get the eigenvalue minus one, and then you get the eigenvalue minus one again, right? It's a root of the characteristic polynomial twice, okay? And then you also have an eigenvalue of five. All right, next up, find your corresponding eigenspaces, okay? And this time, I mean, again, it's just all scalar multiples of one, one, one is one of our eigenspaces. For the repeated eigenvalue, though, we kind of expect that we're gonna get a two-dimensional eigenspace, and indeed we do. And as long as your matrix is normal, actually, this will always happen. Your algebraic and geometric multiplicities will coincide. So if you get an algebraic multiplicity of two, if you get you know, a, 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 an eigenvalue occurring as a root of the characteristic polynomial twice, well then yeah, your geometric multiplicity is also gonna be two, so you're gonna get a two-dimensional eigenspace. Okay, so in this particular case, the two-dimensional eigenspace, it looks like this, right? It's just you have an arbitrary scalar times this, plus an arbitrary scalar times this. In other words, these two vectors here form a basis of the eigenspace corresponding to lambda equals minus one. All right, so again, I'm skipping over those calculations because that's a linear algebra one calculation, okay? and that's something that we would do if we just wanted to diagonalize in the sense of linear algebra one, okay? And if you want to just diagonalize, now you'd be done, basically. You would stick these as the diagonal entries of a diagonal matrix, and you would stick these as columns in the invertible matrix P, and that would be your diagonalization. Here, we don't want just a diagonalization, though. We want spectral decomposition, which would, means we want a unitary matrix, so we need this extra step three here, okay? This is the new thing for the spectral decomposition. We have to construct not just a basis of the eigenspaces, but orthonormal bases of the eigenspaces, okay? So here, the first eigenspace is easy again because it's only one dimensional, right? The first eigenspace is just the multiples of this. It's a line in that direction. So you just pick some unit vector on that line. So in this time, this particular case, I'm gonna pick one over root three, one, 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 right? This is a unit vector. It has length one. I'm just dividing this vector one, one, one by its length. On the other hand, for the eigenvalue lambda equals minus one, we have to be a little bit more careful because the eigenspace is two-dimensional. So now we need to find an orthonormal basis of that two-dimensional space, which isn't as simple as just dividing things by their lengths. We also have this orthogonality requirement that we need. So our, our, our procedure here is to first find two orthogonal vectors in that eigenspace and then divide them by their lengths, okay? So in this particular case, Okay, our eigenspace, again, remember it's the span of these two vectors up here. And in this particular case, it's easy enough to find orthogonal vectors in that eigenspace just by sort of eyeballing them. If we add up these two vectors here, one minus one zero and one zero minus one, we get this vector two minus one minus one. And if we subtract them, 
then we get this vector 0, 1, minus 1. And if you look, I mean, yeah, these are orthogonal, right? Just take their dot products. 0 and 2 gives you 0. This gives you minus 1. This gives you plus 1. Adds up to 0, right? And so they're orthogonal to each other. So in that case, we could just sort of eyeball them. I'll talk about what to do if you can't eyeball them in a second. Okay, so we've got orthogonal vectors in that eigenspace. Now, next up, just divide them by their lengths, right? Normalize those vectors. So the first one divided by, divided by its length, you just get 1 over root 6 times that vector. And the next one divided by its length, you get 1 over root 2 times that vector, okay? And now you've got your orthonormal basis of all the eigenspaces you need. And that's the only real new thing that you have to do for the spectral decomposition instead of just regular diagonalization, right? So we're pretty much done at this point. Now you just construct the spectral decomposition out of these things that you've computed, and the way you do that again is you take your eigenvalues and stick them along the diagonal of a diagonal matrix in whatever order you like. Here I'm doing 5, minus 1, minus 1. I could have done minus 1, minus 1, then 5, or even mixed it up. I could have done minus 1, then 5, then minus 1. Okay, it does not matter as long as when you construct U, you're consistent. As long as when you construct U column-wise, you do things in the same order, okay? So to construct U, you just take these orthonormal bases of the eigenspaces and you stick them in as columns in the same order. So 5 is our first diagonal entry, so I better take 1 over root 3, 1, 1, 1 as my first column of U. Okay, and then minus 1 and minus 1 are my next diagonal entries, so just take these two vectors and stick them in as columns. And these can be in whatever order they, uh, or whatever order I want, right? It doesn't matter if this column corresponds to this minus 1 or this minus 1, okay? So you could swap these last two columns if you want, um, and it would still be a valid uh, spectral decomposition of A. All right, so that's our spectral decomposition. And if you like, you can double check all of this to see that it actually does work out. So there are two things you have to do to double check that a spectral decomposition really is a spectral decomposition. The first thing, you have to check that when you do U, D, U star, you really do get the matrix A that you started with. And in this particular case, if you do that long and ugly matrix multiplication, you'll see that you do. And the other thing they have to check is you have to check that U star U equals I. In other words, you have to check that this matrix U really is a unitary matrix. Okay, and, and again, of course it is, otherwise we screwed up somewhere along the line. All right, so that's how you compute, compute spectral decompositions, except there's one minor technicality that I want to make a note of now. Okay, in step three there, when finding uh, an orthonormal basis of, of the two-dimensional eigenspace, we were able to eyeball ortho orthogonal vectors. That's not always going to be possible, especially if you have, say, a three-dimensional or four-dimensional uh, eigenspace. So sort of the more routine uh, or sort of algorithmic way of finding those orthonormal bases is instead use the Gram-Schmidt process, okay? So let's scroll back up here. Okay, what you could do is, well, you notice that, hey, starting back up here, I've got a basis of that eigenspace, right? These two vectors, they make a basis of the eigenspace. Well, how do you turn bases into orthonormal bases? You do Gram-Schmidt. So just do Gram-Schmidt starting off with these two vectors, and what you'll get is you'll get exactly what you want. You'll get an orthonormal basis of that eigenspace. Okay, but avoid that when you can, because, I mean, Graham Schmidt's a lot of work. And for the types of problems that we'll see in practice in this course that we'll actually work through by hand, you'll just be able to eyeball it. Okay, that'll do it for today's class. Next class, we're going to answer a question of what was different between these two examples that we went through. Okay, in this first example that we went through, this 2 by 2 example, it was a real matrix but notice that, hey, our spectral decomposition, it had complex entries, right? I mean, here are complex numbers and here are complex numbers. Whereas in our second example, again, it's a real matrix, and our spectral decomposition ended up consisting only of real numbers. So what's the difference between those two matrices? Which matrices, which real matrices, actually have real spectral decompositions as well? Okay, and that's the question that we'll answer next class. So I will see you then.